start with this opening song, and then we'll have our opening prayer. <clears throat> Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. Closely to Him I cling, blessing still pray. Dear God, thank you for letting us be able to come here today, learn more about your word. Please let us be able to take what we learn here, put it into our everyday lives when we leave here. Please be with those who are on the sick list and the prayer list, and please be with those who just need our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.
chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here today. We are thankful that you are here. We are honored to be in the presence of our God. And we have some time now to open up his word and to allow it to speak to us in our context. Let me encourage you to open your Bible to Luke chapter 18 and 19. We're going to be looking at several verses in Luke 18, but uh, eventually we're going to pretty much focus on the first 10 verses of chapter 19 in Luke as we're, we've been looking at different messages over the last uh, couple, three months in the Gospel of Luke. And this morning we're looking at a man who was vertically challenged and wanted to see Jesus, was very curious about this man named Jesus who was coming through his town. And I, I can recall singing a song when I was little about this little man and his desire to want to see Jesus. I also remember, I think it was probably ninth grade, we, we read a book called A Tale of Two Cities. It was a Charles Dickens book. And uh, that, that book is a very important, powerful book, and, and a lot of people have studied it and used it in literature classes, A Tale of Two Cities. Well, today we're going to look at A Tale of Two Men. Actually, it's going to involve three men, but we're going to make the comparison between two men at a time. And if you look at the, the, the stories that Luke records for us by inspiration in chapters 18 and 19, it's quite interesting, and I don't think it's by accident that he groups some of the stories that he does together in the way that he does. There are three successive stories of Jesus' encounter with individuals. A rich young ruler, we don't know his name. A blind man, of which we know his name. And a tax collector, not just a tax collector, a chief tax collector, of which we know his name, and Jesus has an encounter with all three of them. Now it's true, if you have an encounter with Jesus, you never walk away the same. Whether you embrace his message and accept his identity as the Son of God, you'll never walk away the same. And this morning, we're going to look first at this perspective. You're going to tale of two rich men. And the first rich man is talked about in chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. Do you have your Bible open with me there? I want to read through that and notice what Luke says of this rich young man here beginning in verse 18. There was a certain ruler who asked him, speaking of Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All of these I have kept since I was a, a boy, he said. When Jesus said this or heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked right at him. 
and said, How hard is it for a rich man, for the rich, to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus said, What is impossible with men is possible with God. A lot of people have been puzzled at Jesus' teaching, and in particular, his use of a description there or analogy or, or illustration of a camel going through the eye of a needle. A lot of people have tried to determine exactly what Jesus meant there. But there is no doubt that the difficult nature that was evident in his statement is understood by everybody that was there. I mean, the people who heard this asked the question, who can be saved? Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Peter will immediately, on the tail end of this, say, look, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus acknowledges that. What he called this rich young ruler to do, his 12 had already done. They had left their homes. They had left family and jobs and their previous lives to to follow Jesus every day. And now Jesus offers this man the opportunity to be a part of those 12, the others that are following after him, having this special relationship. Not that he would be one of the 12 disciples, but that he would be somebody who was enriched and blessed by following the Savior. But instead of embracing Jesus, he became very sad at the request to sell all that he had because, as Luke points out, he was very wealthy. The other rich man is Zacchaeus. In chapter 19, verses 1 and following, Zacchaeus is described as not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. And I want you to notice in verse 2, it says, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector and was wealthy. You have two stories back to back. This man whom we don't know his name, and now one who we do know, Zacchaeus. And it it said of both of them, one said he was very wealthy, and, and Zacchaeus says he was a chief tax collector and he had great wealth. Now, It's no surprise that this man, who was a chief tax collector, which meant that he was not just a regular tax collector, he was above other ones. It's no doubt, it's no surprise that this man was quite wealthy because of the region that he worked in. He was from Jericho. Now, as you look at that picture from a distance, you're seeing Jericho, which is one of the lowest places on earth in altitude. And because it's so low in proximity to the sea level, it's very hot, very dry. And if it were not for the springs and and the water that was there, that's there to help those uh, places look green in the middle of this desert, what seems like desert wasteland, you would think This place was a wealthy, well-to-do place in Jesus' day. The reality is it was. It was in the Jordan Valley. It was a city that commanded the approach to Jerusalem from the east. It was very strategically located. It was at the crossing of, of a river that gave access to the lands of Jordan to the east, Israel to the west. It was a very strategic location. And in fact, because of the the underground water sources that were available around Jericho, it had great palm trees and forests. It was world famous for its, its groves of basalm trees where people would use uh, those things for the perfume. And in fact, the air for miles around smelled like these trees, it's written. Its gardens of roses were known far and wide. And in fact, in the old city of Jericho, where Zacchaeus most likely lived, in the extended part, you can see this is an aerial overhead view, and this is the ancient city of Jericho. We first read of Jericho in the book of Joshua. 
When the Israelites come into the promised land, and it's Jericho that they march around for seven days. Same Jericho, same location. And in fact, in this location, they've discovered <coughs> this tower, which is, some have estimated, 7,000 years old. One of the oldest pieces of archaeological excavations that have ever been discovered. This tower would have been part of that original city that was built there at Jericho. You know, the one that the walls came tumbling down. Now those walls and what remains of them are now buried under this rubble and they're having to dig all of that up. But in this location, it was also the place where Herod the Great ruler over Israel, who was a king installed by Rome, had built a winter palace. A winter palace because it didn't snow here. It was hot year-round. It was warm year-round. And, and Herod would go from Jerusalem in the winter to Jericho, and he would spend his winters there. In fact, he built this palace. This is sort of the reconstruction of what it would have looked like. But this is the actual palace and the remains of it in Jericho. And, and for all these factors, because of its location, because of its consistent weather, because of some of the things that it was well known for that brought them financial benefit, because Herod chose it to be a, a very strategic place in his, uh, we'll just call it administration, it was a very wealthy town. And there, were a lot of, there was a lot of money flowing through that area. In fact, Josephus, a Jewish historian, called it the fattest in Palestine, a divine region. Jericho was indeed rich with money. It was one of the great taxation centers in all of Israel. And if the tax collectors were getting rich in Jericho, imagine what the chief tax collector was making. This man, Zacchaeus, who, uh, who had reached the top of his profession. He was perhaps the most hated man in the district because of that. I mean, nobody likes the tax man, right? And especially the chief tax man. Notice what Luke writes about him. Chapter 19, verses 1 and following. Jesus enters Jericho, was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to see what was lost. Zacchaeus had wealth. He had not just wealth, he had obscene wealth. Just like the man of Luke chapter 18 that we just read about a few moments ago. This, this rich young ruler, we don't know his name, he was extremely wealthy. He asked Jesus what he had to do to be saved. Jesus said, sell all you have, follow me. You have treasure in heaven. You have two men who are essentially in the same position in life. Remember what Jesus said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What's remarkable is 
People marvel over that statement, but not more than 20 verses later. Not more than 20 verses later, in the very next chapter of Luke's gospel, someone does just that, what Jesus talks about. Zacchaeus threaded the camel through the eye of the needle. Zacchaeus was a rich man. And he, in his response to Jesus, in selling half his possession and saying, if I've defrauded anyone... I'll pay him back fourfold. Jesus declares what God has brought into this man's life. He's been brought back to God. Incredibly, he threaded the camel through the eye of the needle. What an incredible statement. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it. Fourfold. You see, Zacchaeus reflected what John the Immerser had been preaching, probably not far from Jericho, at this place where, where Zacchaeus lived at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Notice what John taught. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is <clears throat> laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked him, what then shall we do? John answered, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has, whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you're authorized to do. You see, the, the corrupt practice in John's day, in Zacchaeus' day, was to collect more than was authorized, to exploit people, to defraud people. And that's what Zacchaeus had done. I don't know if he had kept a list. I don't know in his mind if he had remembered every person that he had defrauded. But he, he declared, if I have defrauded anyone, and I'm sure he had, I will repay that person four times in the amount that I had defrauded. I mean, that's a, a pretty incredible statement. Zacchaeus had lived his life up to that point, probably exploiting and defrauding people of much more money than he was authorized to do. And now he recognizes that that was wrong. It's interesting that the Lord does not tell Zacchaeus to sell all of his possessions, to give the proceeds to the poor, and then to follow him. Jesus needed Zacchaeus to be an influence to those around him in the position that he was in. Think of the impact that Zacchaeus' actions would have had in, we'll call it a trickle-down effect. You've heard of trickle-down economics, one of those policies that was implemented in the 80s, and a lot of people still advocate for that today. But you start at the top, and hopefully it will trickle down to those at the bottom. And certainly Zacchaeus was a man in his position in life that was at the top. And if his attitude and his repentant heart could make the impact on people below him, that would be an incredible thing. Trickle down repentance, trickle down humility. Perhaps God has placed you right where you need to be. Right where you need to be in your community, in your neighborhood, in your place of employment, in your position so that you can influence the people around you. A lot of people want to dictate for God his plans for them. But perhaps God has a plan for us right where we are, for us to be used to his glory, to bring him glory in the realm of influence that we have each and every day. You see, it was a tale of two rich men. One walked away sad, clinging to his money. 
the other joyously opted to open his hand and his heart to the people that he could and would serve those around him. It's quite interesting. But you also read in this section a tale of two blind men. One was read for us earlier by Edward from chapter 18, verses 35 and following. A man named Bartimaeus, who was blind from birth. He cried out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus was a blind man who lived in Jericho. And Jesus healed him as he cried aloud, son of David, have mercy on me. So you have a story of a rich man who wants to know what he needs to do to be saved. Jesus says, sell all you have, follow me, and you have treasure in heaven. He goes away sad. It's a very sad ending to this story. Jesus, on his way into Jericho to meet another rich man, sees a blind man. A man who had never visually, probably, if he was born blind from birth, who would never experienced what it's like to see things. Something we take for granted, right? Perhaps every day. The beautiful thing of eyesight. To be able to see things. This man had not been able to do that. And yet Jesus had done this time and time again for so many people who had suffered from blindness. Jesus healed them. And brought to them something that could not be given by anyone other than God. But the other blind man, in fact, let's go back to this man, Zacchaeus. He was, in a sense, blind, but he was blinded by his greed and sin. <coughs> but both men shared a persistence. Bartimaeus, in crying out for the Lord, Son of David, help me. Have mercy on me. What did Zacchaeus do? This man who had been blinded by greed, by sin for so long, he wanted to seek Jesus out. He wanted to see Jesus. That's what the text says. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was a short man. And so he ran and climbed a tree. And this man who was short in stature ended up being big on repentance. Zacchaeus was wealthy, no doubt, but I doubt he was happy. It's often true that people seek after wealth, and when they, they, they find that wealth, what they're seeking, they often don't find the happiness in that wealth that they have been seeking. And we all understand, because we've been taught by God in His Word, guided by His wisdom, that Happiness, true happiness, is not found in riches. It's not found in material things. And no doubt, Zacchaeus was extremely wealthy, but he was probably very lonely. Because sometimes people who choose that path in life had chosen a way that made him an outcast. Hated by people. Yeah, he had money. But his money didn't love him back the way that he probably desired the love and affection of other people. When he had heard of Jesus, who had welcomed tax collectors, I mean, he probably heard this before. This man, he actually ate with tax collectors and sinners. That right there probably made a big impact on Zacchaeus. Perked his interest, certainly. Despised and hated by all, Zacchaeus was in a tough spot. But he was reaching after the love of God. He was searching for something more. And Zacchaeus was determined to see Jesus and would let nothing stop him. For Zacchaeus to mingle with the crowd at all was a courageous thing to do. Many would have taken a chance to nudge this man, perhaps do more than nudge him, kick him, push him, this little tax collector. 
It was an opportunity not to be missed, of course. Zacchaeus, perhaps, was black and blue with bruises all day. He could not see. The crowd was so big, so large in stature that he could not see. They probably didn't want him to see either. And so he ran ahead and climbed a tree, a tree much like this one. In fact, you can see a person right up here sitting in this tree. It's a very large tree. It's very easy to climb. It has a short trunk. It has wide lateral branches forking out in all directions. Things were not easy for Zacchaeus, but the little man had the courage of a desperate man to climb this tree. And what's interesting is Zacchaeus, who had been blinded by his wealth, blinded by sin, blinded by greed, now took steps to show the entire community that he was a changed man. When Jesus announced that he would stay at his house that day, and when he discovered that he had found a new and wonderful friend, immediately Zacchaeus made a decision. He decided to give half of his goods to the poor. The other half he did not intend to keep to himself, but he wanted to make restitution. You say, well, why not give all of your money to the poor? Well, he gave half his money to those in need, and he needed to take that other half and make the restitution. So in essence, he probably came close to giving away all of his wealth. He needed to make right the wrongs he had committed before. In his restitution, he went far beyond what was legally necessary. Only if robbery was a deliberate and violent act of destruction was a fourfold restitution in order. And you could say, and probably Zacchaeus had argued, I mean, what he was doing was a job. It, was a, it wasn't robbery. Some people might say it is. Exploiting and taking taxes from people. But if it had been an ordinary robbery and the original goods were not restorable, double the value had to be paid. Double. If voluntary confession was made and the voluntary restitution was offered, the value of the original goods had to be paid plus one-fifth. One-fifth. Just a little bit more. But Zacchaeus, he knew the law. He was the son of Abraham too. And Jesus points this out. He was just a, an Israelite who had committed his life to money and greed, and other sinful things. But Zacchaeus, this man, was determined to do far more than the law demanded. He showed this by his deeds, by his deeds that he was a changed man. Do you remember what, what John had said, and we read, it, read from it earlier? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what Zacchaeus was doing. He was bearing fruits that showed that he had repented and changed and turned his heart back to God. And I love how this story ends. With the words that Jesus mentions. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. What great words. But let me point out that we have to be careful about how we take the meaning of this word lost. In the New Testament, it does not mean damned or doomed. I don't know when we, when we use that word about the lost in the world, like they're beyond hope or, or they're doomed, they're damned. Well, they are in a position where they're not in relationship with God. But as long as they are living and breathing, they have an opportunity, right? It simply means, this word simply means, this word lost, it means they're in the wrong place. Have you ever been in the wrong place? Wrong place, the wrong time? Zacchaeus and many other people were in the wrong place in their relationship with God. They were lost in the sense that they were not damned and doomed and, and written off and forgotten. Because Jesus went to these very people. 
And he invited them to repent and to experience and celebrate and to take part in the kingdom of God. You see, a thing is lost when it's gotten out of its own place and it's into the wrong place. And when we find such a thing, we return it to the place that it previously occupied. We put it in its right place. A person is lost when he or she is, has wandered away from God. And that happens every day, unfortunately. When people go to those places where they don't belong, they're lost. When they're found, once again, that person is brought into a relationship with God and they're now occupying that rightful place as an obedient child of God. In his household, in the family of the Father. What a beautiful story where this man who was in the wrong place for so long. And a lot of people, probably the religious leaders of Jesus' day, we, we no doubt know this because they criticized Jesus for going and eating with tax collectors and sinners. People like Zacchaeus. I mean, he probably received some criticism in Jericho for saying, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. There were people who probably looked at Jesus and criticized him for that. But he was going to those places to find those people who were in the wrong place. And to bring them back to God. And Zacchaeus is a man who recognized the love of God and the mercy of God that had been brought to his house that day. Today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Fortunately for Zacchaeus, he has this encounter with Jesus. This moment in time that changed his life forever. The course, the trajectory of his life. And certainly changed his place. This man who was lost is now found. How about you this morning? Are you in the right place in that relationship with God? Or are you, as Jesus would say, lost in the wrong place? Only an encounter with Jesus. Only embracing Jesus as Zacchaeus did. By repenting, can we come to that place, which is the right place, by the Savior's side? Perhaps this morning you're not a child of God. You never responded to the gospel of Jesus. You've never been immersed in the waters of baptism, having your sins washed away by His blood. That's the right place. And if we're not in, in that relationship, having obeyed the gospel, an obedient child of God, we're in the wrong place. But that can be changed, right? If Zacchaeus could thread the eye of a needle with a camel, certainly we can repent. And whatever our circumstance is, and have that relationship with God, as Zacchaeus did. A man who was despised, hated, viewed as evil, no good, worthless by so many people. God placed value on that man because he places value on all of us. He placed value even on Zacchaeus who was probably written off by a lot of people. But thankfully, God doesn't write off anyone. Isn't that a remarkable thing? God doesn't write us off. He's just trying to get us to the right place. And this morning, if you need to get to that place, let us know as we stand and as we sing this song.
Lord's Supper, we'll sing this song. haven't picked up the bread and the fruit of the vine, if you'll raise your hand, that will be brought to you. We're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper to remember, just to remember what our Lord has done for us. It's a privilege to assemble. It's a privilege to remember, and as we eat the bread, as we drink the fruit of the vine, I'd like for us to consider some select verses of the Holy Scriptures that's taken from the 15th and 16th chapter of the book of Mark. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. 
Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Elio, 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 lama sabathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. Some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Let us pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this Lord's Day. Father, we're thankful for your grace, your love, your mercy that you've shown us in sending Jesus to die for us. Father, we're thankful that we can eat of this bread and remember what you've done for us. Father, we're very sorrowful that Jesus had to suffer and die. We're so thankful for the salvation Father, we're so thankful for the life that we have with you. Father, we'd ask that you'd bless this bread as we eat. Help us, Father, never to forget. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please eat of the bread. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected man of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Joseph brought a linen shroud, taking him down, wrapped him in a linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that he cut out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, saw where he was laid. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen He is not here. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the death of your son. Father, that he died in our place. We're so thankful, Father, that you raised him on the first day of the week. Father, we're so thankful that we can name Jesus as our Lord and King. Father, that we can worship you here today. Bless this fruit of the vine. Bless us as we drink of it. May we never forget what you've done for us. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please drink of the fruit of the vine. We are also privileged on the first day of the week to give of what God has so uh, given to us. The collection uh, occurs every first day of the week. There's a box in the back if you haven't uh, put it in there and you'd like to, uh, please do that as you exit the auditorium. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth In chapter 16, beginning verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also are you to do. On the first day of the week, let every one of you put, away, put aside something and store it up, as he has prospered, that there would be no collection when I come to get it. 
We have the privilege to give, to store it up, that we can spend it when the need arises. Let us please pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, you have given us so much. You've given us all the spiritual blessings through Jesus, our Savior. Father, you've given us all the creation that you created. You've blessed us so abundantly. We ask that you would receive our giving this morning. Receive it as our expression of our love for you. May we be able to do good things within the community, within the world, with the money that we give. Bless our collection this day, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you out. It's certainly been a good morning. <clears throat> we have a few announcements to make before we close. We certainly want to remember all those on the prayer list. Uh, there's many that each one of us know about that others probably do not. So remember as we pray that we pray for all that we know and can. But let us remember Paul Scott, that's Susie Scott's father in law. He had open heart surgery. Um, it was announced Wednesday that he, he was doing really well and, and he's in re rehabilitation at Belfry Landing. So, Chris Harrison, that's Scott and Katie's sister in law, has finished radiation at this time. Rose Warden, that's Missy Joy's mother, they, they have found multiple new spots of cancer and are developing treatment at Plan. So, let's certainly remember Rose and Missy and all that family at this time. David Newberry had an MRI. No infection was found, and that's good news. Dave is, if you talk to Dave, he says he's slowly improving, but, you know, it's a struggle, so let's remember those. Jan Sisko, um, as Scott and Katie's brother-in-law, is, is diagnosed with dementia and has been recently placed in the hospital. They are meeting with their doctors to determine a plan. I knew Scott and Katie have been going down to see him. Lois Kaplinger is struggling with her health and has an upcoming doctor's appointment. Uh, let us also remember Rosemary Eaton. She's continuing to deal with her doctors and stomach issues. Dana Rose, um, Tim Parsons, Michaela Harris, Joe's daughter in law. Yes, Joe. Okay, so I say, Michaela, it's Michael Ebb. We want to remember her. She has found another issue and have, having tests run. So if you did not hear that very well, please ask Joe to repeat it because I couldn't already hear him. So um, Denver Horn, he's back here with us. We're certainly glad to see Denver. Um, we remember him in our prayers with his health issue. Harry Miller uh, is down with the back. And while I'm at this point, I want to read a card from Harry. He says, we used to thank the congregation for their prayers, cards, food, and phone calls. Fracture is healing, running tests to find out why. So let's remember Harry, and he sure appreciates all the visits, the phone calls, and the food. Missy Fleek, uh, she's recovering from her surgery. Becky Tread Treadway, she's still struggling with COVID. There you are. She's making good progress. It's just she's still on her oxygen machine. Let's remember Becky. Damon Miller with his heart. Of course, remember Peggy Allman and Sandra Collins and Harold and Glenn and Morrison. Glenn has been out with us, and we're certainly glad to see that. Um, just remember the sick and the shut-ins and, and send them cards and make phone calls. There's Peggy's phone number, her address, and there's Sandra's phone number and her address. Uh, we, we post that every week. Hopefully it's for a good cause. Each one of us need to d fulfill our responsibility by checking on each other. 
congratulations. Uh, we're going to have a, a acknowledgement to honor the, those that are moving up in, in school. Uh, we'll have a potluck following the morning Bible class to honor our children for these accomplishments. And we want to encourage each one to stay and all are welcome to stay. Uh, once again, we want to encourage each one to reach out to one another. Our Sunday evening services will be denied at 5 p.m. This service here will be broadcast on Facebook 5 p.m. or there about that time. Uh, remember our weekly Bible class is, is at 7. Uh, Ernie will be teaching the adult class and we encourage everyone to come for that. Uh, I've already announced that. <clears throat> I have a couple other announcements to make. Harry's probably given up on me. But uh, he has a bunch of, or a load of wood, I should say, that he wants hauled out of there. He asked me to do that probably two months ago, and I've just not done it yet. So if anybody needs wood or wants to help, I want to try to do that this week. I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So if you're available and like to help with that, um, please let me know. I have one volunteer already. And another thing is I made an announcement. I have a goal to have the handrail up by the end of this month. I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week and four days next week. Uh, anybody's willing to help, you have any ideas how you think it ought to be done or what you would like to see, please let that be known. I mean, just because you let us know it might not happen that way, but, you know, we look at price, we look at the you know, availability and how we want to do it. And we want it to look nice, but we want it to be serve a purpose. So if anybody's available and you have any ideas, please let me know. I'm going to turn it over to Ernie right now, and he can uh, honor our children. <coughs> So we want to acknowledge our young people this morning, and we want to celebrate some of their great successes. I think I might even have a couple surprises in here once it's all said and done. But we want to start off by acknowledging, first of all, we have a 2021 preschool graduate this year, and that's Miss Emery Osborne. So Emery, if you'll come up here, I have a gift for you. I'm not going to bite you, I promise. We have for her a young reader's... Um, Bible, it's got 70 Bible stories in it for you, and that's all for you, okay? Yeah, it's yours. Yes. <laughs> for our kindergarten graduate class of 2020, which would have been last year's kindergarten graduate class, they now have already completed first grade and will be going on to second grade this year. First one we would like to acknowledge is Brody Cornell. So Brody, if you'll come up here. And he is getting his own um, English Standard Version Bible, and it is his to keep. That way, all of our kids, if they've kept their Bibles over the years, every one of our kids has the same Bible in every Bible class by the time they finish first grade. So congratulations, Brody. And then we also have, yeah, I did find this one. This one's my mom. I couldn't find one, so I thought this would embody homeschooling as well as it would pull me through COVID. And this is for Bryson Hall. I told you I had some great pictures to choose from. <laughs> the other one was the option of having him hanging out in the back of I think, Joe's car, thanking the teachers for their great year. So Bryson, that Bible is for you, buddy. Congratulations. There you go, bud. <laughs> Seriously, it's a hoot. You don't understand. I had a fun time looking through those pictures. Um, we have one that promoted from fourth grade uh, two years ago. So it would have been in 2020. He will now be a sixth grader this upcoming year. He's unable to be here this morning, but that would have been Mr. Garrett Fleet. So Garrett is now going to be in sixth grade this year. 
And then we had the scary ones. We had kids that left the middle school and are now at the high school level. We had one two years ago that went up there. And he is none other than Mr. Ethan Knotts. It was either the picture of him playing in the snow or holding a bowling ball. Those were my options. <laughs> so we want to congratulate Ethan. Ethan is now going to be a sophomore? Mm -hmm. Ah, sophomore in high school. This next picture, I had a lot of different pictures to choose from. Uh, several of them had a tongue sticking out, but I chose to go with the calmer, more relaxed picture <coughs> of this person. For eighth grade promotion is Pastor, who is now going to be a freshman in high school. Let me repeat that for some of you. Yes, freshman in high school, none other than Mr. Henry Kale. <laughs> there were a lot of soccer pictures. Most of them had ball being thrown, several of them. <coughs> And they're all receiving, by the way, an overview of the entire Bible. It's a short, like, it's got, it's got color pictures in there, so it's really nice, and it's just got a lot of information given to them, details about various things. And as I get, I mentioned, yes, freshman in high school, none other than Miss Paige Cornell holding her freshman year schedule. She was very excited about that. You were scared of what picture I was going to put up there? Oh, there were a few. But I wanted to kind of acknowledge something else. I just found this out this morning, so I'm going to be working on this one. Um, I didn't have any pictures of them, uh, but I will work on this. We have our kids, just so you know, Waylon, who is Bernice's grand grandson, is going to, I don't have it for you yet, so just hold on, okay? But he's going to be going into first grade this year. Owen is going to be going into third grade this year. Jacob's going to be going into fourth grade this year. He's like, yes. Uh, Nathaniel's going to be going into seventh. Connor's going to be in... You're in eighth grade this year, right? One more year and he's in high school. Uh, I'm, we're ahead of you, but you're, yeah. Um, and then I want to hear, let you hear this. We have five juniors in high school this year. Five. Five. Chloe will be a junior. Ethan. Joy will be a junior. Riley will, Fleet will be a junior. Aiden is a junior. And Edward is a junior this year. And we will have two seniors this year. We have Mackenzie Soprano. And also, Mr. Henry Thompson will be seniors this year. And last but not least, I have a special letter to share with you this morning. And it's a very great congratulation for me to share with you all. To the members of the Little Hockey Church of Christ, thank you for allowing us to borrow Jeremiah this summer for an internship at the Barley Vincent Church of Christ. He accomplished above and beyond what most interns even begin to accomplish along with the normal church operation and ministerial study, his summer was quite busy. His first week here, he hit the ground running by assisting and setting up for the 2021 Mid-Ohio Valley Lectureship Series, which he was a featured speaker after a last-minute cancellation. And after his session, he was very well received by numerous of veteran gospel preachers, one even saying, I could not have done that. I'm sorry, I didn't read that. I could not have ever done so well at that age. After the lectures, he didn't slow up. He worked with various church camps, taught DV youth class, worked with our food giveaway program, assisted with our live stream and technology, and preached on numerous occasions, on a number of occasions. And working with older members, he assisted in the Tom Butterfield retirement party and brought lessons and songs to the ladies at the Love and Care Nursing Home. Along with this, he helped with a few construction projects, worked with the Civic Hand Club at the Belfry Homecoming, and a number of things at the extreme last minute, especially after my second born decided to eat a pill where we were rushed to the hospital in Columbus. While worried, it was a huge relief knowing that Jeremiah was back at the church taking care of the, need, the needed business. Through his work ethic, biblical knowledge, and love of sharing the gospel, one can tell his parents and his church raised and taught him as Christians should. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for being a church that spreads the true message of Christ to young and old alike, and thank you for being a church that assisted and the knowledge of such a fine young man. And thank you for not being a shaded lamp, but for being a shining light in this world. Brother Nathan Reed, about Jeremiah. So let us congratulate all of our young people on all of the numerous accomplishments.
say congratulations, and it is just an honor to know each one of you and the kids you're raising. Keep up the good job. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we so humbled, dear God, for the day you've given us. Thankful, Father, for the opportunity to sing praises to you and to honor and glorify you. Father, our prayer is that you accept our worship today and that each one of us has worshiped you from the heart. Father, we ask that you go with us through life. We ask, Father, it, it can be sad moments, it can be joyous moments. And we just pray, Father, that you be with those that have families that are sick. You know, it's tough, Father, and we just pray that you give us strength. Help us, Father, to survive the decisions that are made. And just pray, Father, that you be with the doctors and the nurses and all that are attending to our family, our loved ones. And just pray, Father, that you will restore them the normal portion of health, if it be your will. But, Father, most importantly, help us to serve you, help us to honor you, and help us to accept your will. Father, we're so happy for the young that we have here, the, the kids that we just honored, the kids that are here. Father, we just, we're just proud of them. We just thank you so much for them. And just pray, Father, that you help us to be the example that we need to be. Help us, Father, to be an encouragement to them. But, Father, keep them safe. We ask that you watch over them wherever they are, whether they're in college or high school or grade school. We just pray, Father, that you be with our children. Father, we especially ask a special blessing on those that are moving up this year to a new environment, a different schedule, an all-new world. And we just pray, Father, that you be with them also. Encourage them and bless them. Father, go with us now as we leave this building and we go into class. And just pray, Father, that everything we say and do is acceptable and well-pleasing to you. For we pray in your son's most precious name. Amen. Last song we dismiss the class. <laughs> Jesus.